Hi, Shiva. Thanks so much for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to this. Let's uh, start with your childhood. There are things we learn in our childhood that help us with our successes and our failures. And there are things we have to unlearn from our childhood. Talk to me about your childhood. What are some things you've learned that have helped you? And what are some things you've had to unlearn? One of the big things that I learned growing up was I was told always repeatedly, no work is too big or too small. There is nothing that you can't do that is beyond your reach. So don't be intimidated by um, by any task and opt out of it just because you think that it will be too hard or it will take too long or you won't be able to do it. Um, but at the same time, don't be ashamed to do the small stuff either. Um, you know, my parents, since they built something from the ground up, they there were times when they were doing all kinds of things that uh, you wouldn't think of doing as a practicing doctor, but they never shied away from that. And that's how they raised us, um, that whatever is needed should be done. And there is no shame in learning to do things that you may not be looking to make a profession out of it but if they are things that need to be done then you need to step up and do them and take pride in doing them um i think that has really helped me in my career and life uh, because later on after i left the sheltered home um i moved to another country all by myself i switched career paths and had a lot of time a lot of times when I was just knocking against a closed door and trying to figure things out that required some resourcefulness and creativity. And um, because I had that open-mindedness about if this is what where I want to go, I, I should be able to do it. Um, and also at the same time, the willingness to do what it takes to get there, um, irrespective of whether that was what I was trying to do up until then or what I had aspired to do, um, but just looking at it as a necessary thing to get done in order to get to where I'm going. Um, and just that mindset was really helpful in giving me the resilience and um, the persistence to overcome those obstacles. Let's go back to, you finished your MBBS. You, I, I imagine this is when you've moved to the States and you've landed here, and you're trying to figure out what you're going to do now. Um, I did my med school in the Caribbean. Um, not the exact same thing, but you have to do residency all over again um, for those listening. Talk to me about that decision. What were you feeling, and how did you make the decision to go into venture? Coming from a clinical background, um, venture and investing is as far as you can get from clinical practice, I would say. So talk to me about that that decision you made and, and how do you how did you make that decision? Yeah, so at the time when I made the first transition, which was outside of clinical medicine, just entering the world of technology and business and leaving the world of clinical practice, I didn't even know what venture capital was. Um I had no um it, it wasn't done with an intention or a goal of becoming an investor. It was more done by the desire and the drive to use technology as a lever to create more impact. Um, so I grew up in a household of physicians. I had seen my parents see create massive impact in their community. They started the first hospital in the city they lived in and massively impacted the healthcare ecosystem in that community um, and continue to do so. But I just wanted to be able to do something at a bigger scale than touching one patient at a time and um, just being able to do that. Um, so I used, and I thought of technology as a lever to scale that impact and to help me reach more people. And that's what the initial driver was. That's really all I knew that I wanted, I came here in the to the States to learn uh, about technology. That's what I came for at the graduate program at Stanford and how to use it as a lever to change the world of healthcare. Um, that was the idea, that was the motivation. And then after that, it was one step after another, right? Like once I landed at Stanford, that's where I got exposed to the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. 
uh, other people who had made career transitions on campus, uh, so even some of my professors who were involved in multiple things and this whole idea of you can only do one thing um, was shattered. And um, that, that was liberating. Um, and that empowered me to start looking at how can I leverage what I have already learned and the skills I have gained to create more impact and to go where I want to go in terms of leveraging technology to change healthcare. After graduating from the program at Stanford, I joined a startup. I led product for them. They were building software as a service products selling to hospitals and health systems. And that was my experience on the operating side. Um, and the lesson that I took away from there was it's not enough to build a great product or to build a great technology because if there is not a good business model around it, if there's not an organization that can um, actually get people, get, get the product to people and uh, enable the distribution and reach consumers, then you can build anything in a lab, but if it can't reach people, then it won't create the impact that you desired it to have. And that was sort of the light bulb aha moment that led to the interest on the business side of things. Okay, this is really the lever that will unlock the potential of any technology. So how do I um how do I learn about that? And that led to the transition to business school at Wharton where I did my MBA focused on healthcare and finance. And I did a summer internship in venture capital uh, at a firm in Philadelphia. And that really was my first exposure to venture capital is the long answer. Um, that's when I learned what venture capital means, what investing means. And uh, it was really um, an eye opener. And uh, I really enjoyed that internship and decided to pursue a career path on that, on that side of the world. Do you think it's better to be a generalist or a specialist as an investor? Do you think it's better to hone in one niche or to be more of a generalist and focus on recognizing founders who are experts in those, their own industries and back them? I think there is no straightforward answer to that. Um, it depends, unfortunately, is the, the cop-out answer, but um, it depends on the stage at which you are investing. Um, and while being a generalist may work for some industries, it may not for others. There are some industries that are definitely more entrenched and require more specialized knowledge um, for you to be not able, not only be able to understand if this business is solving a real problem, what would it take for them What in, from a regulatory perspective, from a policy perspective, from a business model perspective perspective to really gain widespread adoption amongst their consumer base um, and also to help them materially post investing if you are somebody who's leading rounds and taking board seats and all of that. Um, so the, I think there is room for both. Um, that said, in industries like healthcare, I think it is very easy to believe in the potential of something without truly being able to estimate and de-risk the roadblocks um, that that might lie in on the path to achieving that potential. And in order to really be able to have an insightful understanding of the different roadblocks that a business may need to go through and tack block and tackle before they can achieve their potential, there has to be somebody around the table who has that domain expertise. Um, now, one way that people get around it is take help from experts or consultants and things like that. And that model has worked in more on the private equity side of the world where they will really bring in a specialized firm to do some various um, aspects, specific aspects of diligence and the diligence processes run for months and go very deep. Um, it doesn't typically work in the venture capital world because the speed of decision making on deals is just so much faster and the processes are often very competitive. Um, and to be honest, these companies are so early in their trajectory that there is very little data for us to dig into. And um, hence, very often people are making bets based on their view of the market, which is 
preformed you form your view of the market and identify the opportunity spaces before you meet a particular business and often based on their intuition about the ability of the team to execute um now all of those are great markers but i think well in industries like healthcare which are regulated spaces and have specific nuances in terms of who makes the decision to buy versus who's the actual user um, is often very different. And um, also the, the adoption and implementation of things may not be very straightforward. Um, so really requires someone to be able to either have worked in that space before and come in with that understanding or be willing to do the work and go deep. And often in terms of how quickly the deals move in venture capital, we just don't have the time to be able to do that work, even if someone wants to. Hence, I, I feel that for industries like healthcare, there's value in being specialists. Um, that doesn't mean you can't work with generalists because even generalists usually have one or two or three core strengths. So someone may be really good at hiring executives for a t for their portfolio companies teams. And um, that person may be good to work with as a co-investor or have someone on the cap table because that they can really help build a team at the early stages of the business. So the, they, they can come with various trends, even if it's not industry knowledge. That doesn't, I, I think there is room for both. Okay, that's a very thorough and comprehensive answer. Thanks for that, Shubra. Let's talk about your own diligence process. How much do you rely on structure and how much do you rely on intuition and decision making? And you can talk about the founders of the product or whichever part of the diligence process you want to talk about. Yeah, so I would say it's a mix. Um, It starts... And uh, I don't know if you've seen that cycle of it, it's structured, then it's messy in between, then it's structured again. And I think that's that's what it ends up being. So we are very thematic in the way we invest. And uh, I would develop my view on certain market spaces uh, in much more uh, in advance of meeting a particular business typically. So every year I'll pick three or four themes and just dive deep into them and try to understand where is the white space, where is the ability to build a good business in this particular space. And um, then hopefully when I meet a particular company, I can go into that conversation with a little bit of more of an informed view and ask them some questions to figure out do they fit in that white space or are they playing in a very crowded uh, part of that market or um, how much of the how much of the quarters five forces leverage are they going to have versus versus other competitors and market forces right um, now in that same first meeting the intuitive part of it is how does the founder come across how does the team come across are they a strong team um, and so it's a mix of both. I'm going in with a structured view um, on the on the market space and trying to figure out how they fit into that. But then at the same time, my intuition is working in the background and trying to pick up all kinds of signs and signals um, around the team and the business, right? Um, and then I think I would say after that first meeting, if they check some of the very basic boxes on the market view, then the decision is guided by intuition as to whether we want to dive deeper into diligence or not. If there was something that just seemed off about the team, the co-founder dynamic wasn't great during that presentation, um, something that ticked you off, you know, um, then we may, we may just decide to pass, but uh, otherwise we'll go deeper into diligence. And the diligence process, I would say, is relatively structured. Um, so we'll we'll do the usual suspects. We'll go through all of the financial analysis. We'll do a competitive analysis. We'll do the reference calls. Now, the reference calls is the piece of diligence where there is a little bit more intuition playing in, right? You're trying to read between the lines a little bit. You're trying to push people to give you the information that maybe they don't want to come out, come right out of the gate with. Um, and your intuition can guide that a little bit. Um, then 
after we have done all of that analysis and we have the structured bullets checked off, again, the intuition plays a little bit more of a role because the truth is we're always looking at many opportunities and it has to rise up to the surface in that pool of opportunities, right? Like so if I can only spend time on one deal and I have four that I'm looking at, then at some level that becomes an intuitive decision in terms of this seems more exciting than the other. Um, and um, I, I, I think that's, what is intuition really? Intuition is thousands of years of structured decision-making distilled into this fuzzy power that all of us as humans have, which has been generated through our ancestors' evolutionary development. Um, so I would say intuition is nothing but condensed distilled structured knowledge um and we continue to build on top of that by gaining more structured knowledge and doing more analysis in our lifetimes but it would be stupid to ignore this wealth of resource that you already have um so we try to strike a fine balance between both i'm in the midst of uh planning a pitch competition and i'll be launching it soon I'm figuring out the criteria to evaluate founders for my diligence team. And there are two things I'm debating. A, is the fact that we are over-reliant on previous founding experience a fallacy? Uh, I think Harvard Business Review said it's a 30% chance of more success if you have a previous successful founder. Is that true still, or is that study too old now? And then B, does it matter how long the founders have known each other? in terms of months or years. And I would love to hear your thoughts on uh, those two things in particular. Um, I'm gonna take the more conservative and expected answer here probably and say that both of those things do matter. Um, and um, here is why, because a lot of times when you're a first time founder, it's, it's just a learning process. And um, sometimes you're, paying for their education um, yeah. and sometimes that's okay it depends on their pace of learning and how quick their feedback loops are if they learn and iterate and execute on that learning really quickly then it can still work the first time it does many times um, but that said the second time founder does have an advantage in terms of being able to see around the corners a little bit and skip a few missteps um and that can be material in the trajectory of the company in terms of their ability to be a little bit more capital efficient in terms of their ability to hire better in terms of their ability to choose the best investors to build a better board um so i i do think that it matters um now that said you also if you want to take a more nuanced approach you have to think about why they were a success the first time. Were they really the factor that led to the success? Um, or was it just plain luck, which happens a lot of times? Or was it somebody else on the founding team? Or um, And see how translatable that is. If that was something else other than them, then see how translatable that is to this current business and this current market opportunity. Um, without like giving them too much credit for it. So I, I think you have to balance that a little bit. In terms of the length of the relationship between co-founders, I do think it matters because trust is a weird thing. You just automatically trust people more when you've known them for a long time, which is insane. You may have spent three whole days with someone and have spent an aggregate number of hours that is a lot more than someone you've just known for 10 years but seen them once every two years for an hour um but you inherently trust that person more um and that's just how human brain works um the other thing that happens is once you dig a little bit deeper into that and if they have really spent the 10,000 hours or whatever together in any capacity then hopefully they have been through some ups and downs together and that builds a very strong bond and enables them to navigate those ups and downs as eventually will happen during the journey of the startup. Uh, so I do think it matters, 
but also the intensity of the relationship matters. Um, you can dig in a little bit deeper by asking questions like, what are some of the most difficult experiences you have had together? How did you navigate that? What was a time when you had a fight? And how did you navigate that? Uh, what was the longest you went without talking to each other? How do you both handle conflict? So there, those are also things that matter. Length is not the only thing, but it is definitely a factor. I love this answer, Shubra. Quality over quantity. The gold is in the details. Yeah. I'll give you a scenario. You come across the perfect founder, but they're working on the completely wrong problem in the wrong industry. You can tell they're not going to be successful. Do you invest in them to maintain the relationship and have the opportunity to invest in their next company? Or do you pass and try and keep a relationship with them for their next project in some other capacity? I personally will choose, I know the people. there are people who do the former, but I personally will choose to pass and try to build the relationship another way. Um, maybe I can still advise them. Maybe I can still be resourceful for them and send them things that may be helpful to them. But I would not invest in a business that I don't believe in, even if there is a founder that I do believe in. Um, and I will wait for them to come around the next time. Okay, I think that makes sense. Let's talk about markets. Venture is a game of predicting markets five to eight years from now, predicting M&A activity, if the market is going to be bullish, what IPO price they're going to get. We tend to think of our successes as internal and our failures as external, whereas usually it's the opposite. Tailwinds drive a considerable amount of success. Bill Gross did the study in Idea Lab that why now or market timing was the most important predictor of success for startups in early stage. For the listeners, this is completely different from public markets and there are no parallels to be drawn here. Tell me about what tailwinds are you banking on for your investments for the next five years? So I, I'll answer that, but with a caveat first, I think this is generally true, but it is relatively speaking less true for healthcare. Um, I think it's more acyclical uh, and a little bit longer to play out um, than some of the other more consumer facing fad industries, right? Like, so, so with that caveat, tailwinds that we are, we believe in and um, are backing, um, one big one is data sharing and interoperability. I think the whole healthcare industry has been talking about that for a while and then, uh, and when meaningful use uh, mandated the implementation of electronic medical records. We created the biggest, most rich database of medical information that sits in silos in various corners of organizations and doesn't talk to each other. And there has been an increasing awareness and movement within the industry to change that and to help us all as consumers, but also various stakeholders within the healthcare business ecosystem to be able to share that data, glean insights and inform their various business models. Um, and I think that is finally happening with the FIRE rule uh, and the 21st Century Cures Act coming in last year. I, I, I think that there are more rules coming from a regulatory perspective and more businesses being built to um, capture that value. Um, and also more openness from incumbents than we have seen before, because I think the incumbents are finally starting to realize that if they don't do it, some upstart will come and do it. And um, so they want to get in on the game finally. Um, so I think that's definitely one of the big one. We have also been talking about value-based care for generations um, now. And um, we now finally have the infrastructure that we need to structure value-based care contracts and to deliver care in that manner. Um, also forced by necessity a little bit because we spend more than any other country on healthcare, 18% um, or something of our GDP, which is crazy given the outcomes we have. And we've just hit the ceiling on that. There is not just, there is no slap left in the system for us to continue to provide fee-for-service care and keep charging for it and increase that um, dollar amount spent on healthcare. And so driven by that necessity, but also enabled by this data infrastructure that we now have access to, we are seeing 
both existing organizations like pairs, more traditional ones, but also new kinds of organizations like ACOs and risk-taking providers step up and structure value-based contracts in various shapes and forms. And we think that that is certainly a trend that will continue. Um, one other big trend that emerged during COVID was telemedicine, and there is more adoption and uh, openness of, of telemedicine, both amongst physicians and amongst consumers. Um, we think there will be a second layer of startups that will be able to leverage the data that we are getting from telemedicine. So, so far, it was incredibly hard to really know what goes on in a physician-patient interaction because of all the privacy laws and HIPAA and everything. And those laws are all still existent and should be, but um, I think there is just more data on various things, even just the traffic of those interactions, but also the details of those interactions with medical scribing becoming more common, with there being more telehealth visits. And there are a lot of things that don't get recorded in the EMR, that, that patient-physician interaction is a valuable source of information and only some percent of it makes it to the EHR. With these interactions happening more virtually and their medical scribing being more prom uh, commonly available and used, we think that there will be this wealth of data that is created and a series of startups that can leverage that um, to provide better care delivery. Those are all great tailwinds. And I completely agree. I'm banking on a hybrid home care model. Um, especially hospital at home, I think will be massive. As an LP, tell me about the criteria you use to invest in funds and talk to me about if a fund came to you and say, we will structure our fund over 20 years to better align with value creation in healthcare. How would you react to that statement, Shubra? Um, so in terms of our criteria to invest in funds, we try to invest in funds that can be synergistic with our direct investing strategy. So just as a recap, our direct investing strategy is essentially Series A all the way to IPO, lead or co-lead rounds, take board seats. Um, and we're high conviction investors will look to put a decent amount of money to work in a particular investment and run a pretty concentrated book. So we're looking to invest in funds that are synergistic with that strategy and can be good deal flow channels for us, essentially, good feeder funds for us. Um, and not in the traditional sense, though, because we're not the LPs that want access to co-invest in SPVs. Um, we don't do that. Uh, we will come in and lead the round of one of your portfolio companies as they're coming up for their next raise, which everybody values, especially in this environment. The portfolio company is happy if they don't have to run a full process. The VC fund manager is happy we can mark up their companies and we are happy because it's a deal flow channel for us. So it's a win-win-win situation. So what does that mean realistically? Essentially funds that are focused on investing in healthcare technology companies in pre-seed or seed stage. Uh, we don't do therapeutics and we don't do services. So anything that has a technology component could be software or hardware. So we will do diagnostics, devices, digital health, health IT. So if you're a seed, pre-seed focused fund investing in any of these categories, that could be potentially a good fit for us. And are you um, looking? You asked the second part of that question. Yeah, the second part was um, there's something I struggle with because I feel like the the cycle of companies in healthcare to go from idea to product market fit to growth would be 20 years, which doesn't fit the traditional venture cycle of a 10 year fund return. How would you? I don't think it's, I, I don't think it's 20 years for a healthcare technology company today. Now, it was 20 years for companies like Amada because they were the first generation of healthcare tech companies being created. They sort of charted the path for what it does it look like for to have a healthcare technology company. But I think today we're we're seeing that accelerate a decent bit. It's still not the same as technology venture capital cycles, right? Like it's not the three to five years. No. Um, 
but I'd say it's coming in between five to 10 years uh, at this point from inception to taking a company public or having a meaningful exit if you execute it right. And we're starting to see some examples of that happen. Um, so hopefully if you really are a healthcare technology business and you're not developing a drug and you're not building a variety of clinics around the country, then um, I think it should fit somewhere in that five to 10 year time frame. And what do you look for in GPs? What do you look for in terms of, are they previous founders? Do they have a deep finance background? Um, what is the rough criteria used to evaluate them? Yeah, so because we're investing in the seed, pre-seed focused funds, I think the finance background is not really as material or important. Uh, a lot of people who are investing in those stages really are investing in companies before they've built their financial model for the first time. So um, there's very little financial analysis that can be done. Um, but what matters is, do they understand how startups work? Specifically, do they understand how healthcare startups work? Because they're a little bit different. Um, do they have a network to source great deals from? Do they have the reputation in the industry to be able to get in and win the right deals? Because uh, it's competitive out there. Um, and then do they have a measured, disciplined investment diligence decision process and their own judgment to be able to stay uh, true to what they're promising their LPs to not have strategy creep or not have um, inflated valuations just to show activity and do more deals. As we saw a lot of firms do in the frothy environment in 2020 and 21, right? Like, so we look for a little bit of that discipline and, um, are they doing what they say they're going to do? And can we trust them with that? Um, and are they, Or are they going to get swayed by what others are doing and what is going on in the market? So a little bit of that is super important. Um, and then, I mean, I think at the seed, pre-seed stages, it's about having a good intuition for both the market and the founder. Um, so do they have a good sense of where healthcare is today? Where is it going? What is needed in terms of startup innovation to help us cover that gap um, and are able to find and bet on companies that are working to fill that gap? Uh, and do our view does our view of the world there align with theirs? There are people who would argue for hype investing. We're saying if Andreessen invests in a round, get in. If Sequoia invests in a round, get in. And just the value of that brand name will drive the startup to, and I, I don't buy this completely, but to success. What are your thoughts on hype investing? Is that something you're completely against? Or is that a signal for success to an extent? Yeah, so again, it's one of those things, healthcare is a little bit different from generalist investing here. I think the value of those brand names investing in healthcare is a little bit less and the market recognizes that uh, as opposed to a consumer startup or a B2B SaaS startup. Um, so, so that's the first caveat. The second one is it depends on what type of an investor you are. If you are a small fund that co-invests alongside marquee funds and that is what your investment thesis was when you started the fund. That's what you pitched to your LPs. I will manage uh, to get into the same deals as Sequoia. And that's my edge. Um, and your LPs were happy with that. And that's why they invested in your fund. Then that's great. Um, but if you're not, if you went to raise the fund with the hypothesis that I will figure out what the best companies are and here is why because I have a differentiated view on the market or I have a proprietary deal funnel. Um, then when you go back to raise the next fund, it will be very apparent what strategy you actually followed. And if that that's what I meant in my earlier answer about that's something we look for um, in terms of are you staying true to your strategy? Um, because that fosters trust over time. Um, in terms of it being a predictor of success, to some degree it is, because let's face it, there are 
thousands and thousands of companies and there is already some degree of filtering that happens. Obviously, it is an indicator of something might be good if one of these brand name firms bagged a company, they must have done their diligence. But the, the failure rate of startups is so high that even then, that's not a guarantee of success. And if you are a manager who believes that you have a differentiated viewpoint and you know something about the industry that others don't, or you think differently about something, then I would rather bet on that. Uh, I would rather bet on your own conviction of what someone should be building and what you want to be backing than some other firm doing, you don't know what work they did and you don't know what reason they backed them for. Um, so that's how I would think about it. This is something I struggle with given the high failure rates for early stage startups. Is it even possible to have high conviction or if that just means you're missing something because inevitably at least half of your high conviction startups will fail? That being said, should I invest at 80% conviction or should I still keep pushing myself to find a hundred percent conviction? Yeah, so this is a this is a genuine dilemma of any early stage investor. And um it's always possible to talk yourself out of any deal. Um, no matter how good the deal is, you can always find reasons why the company won't succeed and you can talk yourself out of the deal. So what you have to venture is a game of it's the upside versus downside is skewed. Um, you can only lose one X, but you can make a hundred X. And hence you have to think about where does this go if it goes right? So assume that it goes right and then say, would this be a hundred X if it goes right? Or am I looking at a two X or a three X if it goes right? Um, because if you are, then that doesn't then that doesn't satisfy the power law for investing in venture. So you have to focus. You have to be an eternal optimist to be an entrepreneur, but also to be an early stage investor. You have to focus on what can go right, and if it goes right, where can this get me? Um, rather than these are the seven things that can go wrong. Now, that doesn't mean you ignore the things that can go wrong. You should still do that analysis and figure out what are all the things that can go wrong, and then you work to mitigate that. How deep are you going here? Depending on the vertical you're investing in, SaaS, biotech, pharma, that could mean the company has to go from $0 in ARR to $500 million. Are you actually mapping that out? Are you seeing you know, this is what they need to do to get to that, say, $100 million in ARR and what their path to that looks like? Because I feel like that's the way I would talk myself out of every investment. Is that something you're doing? Yeah. You can't do zero to 100 because here's the problem. There's this value of death in between, which is achieving the product market fit. So they have to go from zero to something in order to prove first that they have built something. First of all, they have built something because a lot of products fail just in terms of technological risk of getting built. Second, people want that thing. And third, there are people which are often different people in healthcare who are willing to pay for that thing. And then they're able, so, so that's the first value, which is the product market fit value. And that goes from zero to, for lack, I don't think there is a number, but like maybe a 1 million in revenue, right? Like at that point, you've proven that you've built something that people want and there is someone who's willing to pay for it. Now, the next question becomes the unit economics. Like, are they paying for it at a, in a, at a scale that the margins are sustainable for the business and you can get to cash flow positive with that? Um, so do you have an engine that is has positive unit economics? Uh, and that's the second value. Um, and so maybe from pick a number to maybe 50 million in revenue, 30 million, 40 million in revenue. That's the value you have to cross and get to the positive unit economics. Once you've gotten to positive unit economics, then you are the master of your own fate. Um, then you can scale and you're scaling with an engine that works instead of just throwing venture money into it and burning. Um, so 
I don't think you can map out everything uh, in terms of zero to 100 million in revenue, but depending on, again, what your investment mandate it is and which risks you feel comfortable taking, some people might say we, we feel comfortable not, we don't feel comfortable taking the technology or product risk. So we want to see that you have at least built a product, especially true for hardware products. Um, some people say we don't want to take the product market fit risk. We want to see that you have some revenue. There is somebody who's willing to pay for what you have built. Um, and then there are people more on the growth equity side of the world who say you need to have a positive unit economics. We need to see that you have something in EBITDA before we can invest. Um, so it depends. Most venture capital firms, I would say, between like Series A and Series C or D would lie in that product market fit to unit economics place where they'll say, um, depending on how early they go, we won't take the product market fit risk, but we will help you figure out the journey to a positive unit economics and we'll help you get there by um capitalizing you to get there um so it depends on which risks you feel comfortable taking talking about unit economics something i have recently found is uh a few founders have come to me and said as we scale our cac will go down and we'll be profitable i don't find that to be the case looking at these uh especially b2c healthcare companies like Romans and Hems, it seems like their CAC took forever to go down. I haven't followed them recently, but it kind of stayed at about, they were not profitable based on their CAC. Have you found that to be true as well in the B2B space? It will not just automatically go down um, if you don't make any effort for it to go down. And it also depends on how much of your um, customer acquisition is organic versus paid? And is that organic portion going up over time? Is there more word of mouth? Is your customer satisfaction score high? Is there a high net retention? So if all of those things add up, then yes, over time, CAC should go down. Um, it also depends on what additional growth levers are you employing? Are you launching in completely new markets? Are you launching completely new product lines, which will not have any additional leverage from the, your existing business. And in that case, it may not go down. So the answer is more nuanced than just because I have been operational for X number of years over time, my CAC will in a linear fashion certainly go down. I, I don't think that statement is true for any business. What are some mistakes GPs make when they are trying to raise from you? And what advice do you have? That's an interesting one. Um, I would say, one, not understanding the LP you're talking to. So any background research you can do, or just even in conversation, taking the time to understand what kind of an LP they are, what is their mandate, what are they, what is their motivation behind investing in funds, what kinds of managers do they like to back, what kinds of returns do they want to see, is there any sort of strategic motivation beyond the financial returns? What other value add can you provide to them or they are looking for from the relationship? So just doing your homework and getting to know your audience a little bit more um, instead of launching into the pitch the first chance you get um, can go a long way in fostering that relationship over time and also in helping you position your pitch correctly because there are a hundred things that you could say in the 30 minutes you have but you can choose to highlight the ones that may appeal to them a little bit more if you had more information about them um so that's number one. Second is understanding that it's more of a relationship business than even investing in startups. So even when we invest in companies, we like to get to know them six months to a year before we invest. We almost never just look at a deal and in four weeks we have written a check to them. Um, just almost never happens for us. And um, I think there are firms on the venture capital side that will do that just because deals move fast and it's competitive. And I understand that. But on the LP side, it's extremely rare to see that um, firms like to get to know the GPs over time and understanding that you're going into this with a long term goal and you're looking to build a relationship um, and having the patience and the mindset to approach conversations in that manner is really important and will go a long way um, in eventually you getting a check from that LP. Um, I think. The third piece that I see people missing is a lot of GPs 
especially the first time ones, do not pay significant attention to or convey in a very articulate manner their portfolio construction strategy, their follow on reserve strategy, their portfolio construction strategy. How will this strategy lead to them achieving the IRR that they are targeting? Um, and that's something that I think a lot of people, if you have only been writing angel checks or if you were an investor at a bigger firm and never really thought about that, but you learned how to source and pick deals, uh, then guess what? You're in a different game now. You're building a firm and a fund and um, portfolio construction really matters. It's not just about, you can't say all the 10 deals that I'm going to pick are going to be winners. Uh, we all know they're not. Uh, and so how do you, underwrite that there are two different camps i've found here there are people who like yourself will invest 10 percent of their fund size per deal and invest in 10 deals total but there are people who will invest one to two percent per deal and invest in up to 50 deals which camp is more attractive to you or would you look at gps from both camps and what are some particular questions or some things you would look for in each camp? So we would index for to the former because we, again, our own philosophy is that we want to have a reason why we invested and it should be a high conviction bet. And we will back the GPs who align with that philosophy, um, who know something about some markets within healthcare, broadly speaking, that we believe is a differentiated viewpoint or they have some kind of a differentiated access to the deal flow in that space and they are able to make bets that they believe are have a an advantaged chance of success over just any other startup right so we don't do this prey and prey strategy and i don't think we'll back gps that do um also, very few people actually do the spray and pray strategy within healthcare. I think that is more commonly done by generalists um, for a variety of reasons, which is understandable. But in healthcare, I think most people uh, who start funds come from some specific sector within healthcare. Maybe they spent all their life at a payer or they have really a lot of relationships on the life sciences side, or they have some edge, some network that they're tapping into as they're starting this fund. And that's what we're investing in it for, um, to get access to that part of the ecosystem. That is very actionable advice, Shubha. Thank you for that. One last question. What is one piece of advice you would give yourself 10 years ago? More patience. Um, I was always in a rush to get everything done. Um, and I think uh, that is something that just comes with age and experience and having seen a few cycles played out now, um, just being a little bit more centered, being a little bit more patient, taking the long-term view, continuing on your path and not getting impatient about seeing results every single day or very, very quickly, but believing in the process, enjoying the process and um, giving yourself the time to breathe a little and to uh, enjoy, enjoy the journey. That's well said. There's a strong push in venture for a very strong bias towards action, which can lead to impatient and poor decision making. And I, like Adam Grant's philosophy here, a moderate procrastination is the best path to success. Thanks so much for this conversation, Shubra. I had a lot of fun and we'll have to do a part two, as I only asked about half the questions I have here. Oh, this was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Rashad, for having me. And I you have a great rest of the day.